morning. Good morning. Did you have a good week? Yeah, that was pretty good. How about you? Good. Real good. Yeah. You know they wait me at the doctor's office? Uh huh. Up down to 119 pounds. David. Well, I lost all of that weight, I guess. Uh, way they call them the eight cooking. <laughs> well, I, I used to be 145. But when we got married, I weighed 135, and then I gained 10 pounds, and I kept that for years, and up until a couple years ago. Uh -huh. And then uh, I guess I worry about her a lot. Yeah. And uh, I, I was 119 pounds. Wow. So <laughs> thin is in. Thin is in. You got that right. You know what it might be though. <laughs> You're doing the cooking now. That's yeah, what, that's what Nell said. Nell said the shit you said. We think alike. Well, that's true. But anyway, well, uh, they weighed me and I. I he I that. he I, does everything. And I don't love it, so I let him do it. <laughs> but you know what? When I was going to that whole list of Dr. St. Louis, I read some books that they had. China study mm -hmm. and uh, with a doc one book was different. Uh, there was a doctor Engelstein from uh, uh, clinic in Ohio, <coughs> Cincinnati, Ohio, I guess, that he was a heart surgeon and he used to operate on people. And he found out that a lot of people wouldn't eat in China. So you become a visible carrier. Mm. He's made he made pictures in this book of people's veins. His other diet in bed, and he put them on a strict vegetable diet. Uh -huh. Their crust, their veins start clearing up in three months. He said, I absolutely, if you eat vegetables, Vegetable diet. Yeah. You don't eat no chocolate or nothing. Only once a year, oh. <laughs> on Christmas or New Year. And his wife is a vegetable carrier too. His name is uh, Dr. Engelstein. Engelstein. He's got a book. I read that whole book. Wow. Here's the bell, please sign, baby. Well, I, I, I just wave to Steve. I don't put the sign. Oh, up. you don't do that. No. Alright. I'm gonna move this son. Okay. Display. I'm showing 30 seconds. All right. Where's display? Oh, there it is. Display. Mm. I guess I started it, didn't I? Yeah. Uh, did you start yours already? Yeah. Where am I at here? Where's the things? Okay, we're still good or is it all for me? Oh, good. That's better. Good okay, we ready? I'm ready. Is it that looks like it's eleven? All right. Okay, here we go. Say Good morning. Good, morning. Good, morning. Good morning. Welcome to Marine Baptist Church Sunday service. Our word for today is resurgence. Let's begin our service today by standing and singing hymn number 82, Victory in Jesus. I heard an old, old story How a Savior came from glory How he gave his life on Calvary To save a wretch like me I heard about his groaning Of his precious blood's atoning then I repented of my sins and won the victory. 
victory, oh victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is due him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. I heard about his healing, of his cleansing power revealing. How he made the lame to walk again, and caused the blind to see. And then I cried, dear Jesus, come and heal my broken spirit. And somehow Jesus came and brought to me the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me all I knew him and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. I heard about a mansion he has built for me in glory. And I heard about the streets of gold beyond the crystal sea. About the angels singing and the old redemption story. And some sweet day I'll sing up there the song of victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath a cleansing flood. Let's remain standing for a word of prayer. <coughs> Dear God, our Father in heaven, we come before you today to honor your name and are here because you deserve our presence according to your will. We understand that our lives on earth are temporary, that we need to learn about you so that we will be good citizens in your kingdom, and we pray that you will fill us with your knowledge. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. Now let's sing hymn number 98, Great is Thy Faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever wilt be. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning new mercies I see. All I have needed thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Summer and winter and springtime and harvest, sun, moon, and stars in their courses above. Join with all nature in manifold witness 
to thy great faithfulness, mercy, and love. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning new mercies I see. All I have made in thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Pardon for sin and a peace that endureth thine own dear presence to cheer and to guide. Strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow. Blessings are mine with ten thousand beside. Great is our faithfulness, great is our faithfulness. Morning by morning new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Thank you. At this time, I'm going to ask Pam to come and bring a reading from our daily bread. Today's reading is called Trusting God in Opposition. And the Bible verse is Daniel 3.18. But, ev but even if he does not, we will serve your gods or worship the image of the... We will not serve the, your gods or worship um, the image of gold you have set up. Raised in a tribe in the Philippines opposed to belief in Christ, Esther received salvation through Jesus after an aunt prayed for her during Esther's battle with a life-threatening illness. Today, Esther leads Bible studies in her local community in spite of threats of violence and even death. She serves joyfully, saying, I can't stop telling people about Jesus because I've experienced the power, love, goodness, and faithfulness of God in my life. Serving God in the face of opposition is a reality for many today, just as it was for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, three young Israelites living in captivity in Babylon. In the book of Daniel, we learn that they refused to pray to a large golden image of King Nebuchadnezzar even when threatened with death. The men testified that God was capable of protecting them, but they chose to serve him even if he didn't rescue them. When they were thrown into the fire, God actually joined them in their suffering. To everyone's amazement, they survived without even a hair of their heads singed. If we face suffering or persecution for an act of faith, ancient and modern examples remind us that God's Spirit is present with us to strengthen and sustain us when we choose to obey Him, even if things turn out differently than we hope. And the prayer is, God, thank you for loving me so generously. Help me to follow you with joy even in the face of opposition. Mm. Our starting point Bible verse for today, Jeremiah 5, 18. Nevertheless, in those days, saith the Lord, I will not make a full end with you. Let's pray. Dear God, we are so thankful that Jesus came to earth to die for our sins, and we want to thank you for enduring that hurt that you must have felt as he was going to the cross. We pray that you will show us how to love you and that we will be the people who will follow and obey you and that we will be usable in your kingdom. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. I thought it would be helpful to define the word resurgence since I pretty much don't ever remember using it in my whole life. I woke up in the middle of the night, Wednesday and I, to Thursday, and I thought that's the word that God was giving me. And uh, it means an increase or revival 
after a period of little activity, popularity, or occurrence, a resurgence of interest in religion, for example. Today, we're going to look at God's resurgence in Israel and the Jews. In Genesis, the very first book in the Bible, God told Abram, who was renamed to Abraham, that God was going to make a great nation out of him. But Abram, Abraham, and Sarai, Sarah, didn't have any children. Abraham was a hundred years old when Isaac was born. Isaac fathered Jacob. Jacob fathered 12 sons. God changed Jacob's name to Israel. That is why Jacob's 12 sons are known as Israel or the 12 tribes of Israel. Last week we learned that the children of Israel, aka the Jews, the Hebrews, got themselves in trouble. But God raised up Moses to save them. God led them through the wilderness, through the sea, God was with them in the Ark of the Covenant, which was his house on earth. God gave them Jericho. God gave them the Promised Land. God gave them a land flowing with milk and honey. God gave them wealth. But... They frittered it away on vanity. They damaged the blessing. The 12 tribes crossed back into Babylon, spiritually and physically. They weren't all idol worshipers or blasphemers. Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, opted for death rather than bow to an idol. And God delivered them from the fire. Surprised? Not if you know God's word. The prophet Jeremiah lived when all this was going on, and they put him in a cistern to shut him up. God gave Jeremiah our starting point Bible verse. Nevertheless, in those days, saith the Lord, I will not make a full end with you. In other words, God will not forget Israel. Obadiah prophesied resurgence. Obadiah 1.17 but upon Mount Zion shall be deliverance, and there shall be holiness, and the house of Jacob shall possess their possessions. This is a screenshot from Bible Hub of Obadiah 117. We see the various translations of Obadiah 117 and on the left, and cross references with other verses that say about the same thing on the right. And I've underlined some of them. One, in Psalms, God will save Zion and rebuild the cities of Judah that they may dwell there and possess it. Number two, the Lord will have compassion on Jacob. Once again, he will choose Israel and settle them in their own land. The foreigner will join them and unite with the house of Jacob. Number three, the nations 
will escort Israel and bring it to its homeland. Then the house of Israel will possess the nations as men servants and maid servants in the Lord's land. And in addition, God gave this message to others in the Bible. Amos, Joel, Ezekiel, Moses, Daniel, and I'm sure there are others that I didn't list. God knew the children of Israel would stray when he called them. He told Moses, and yet for all that, when they be in the land of their enemies, I will not cast them away. Neither will I abhor them to destroy them utterly and to break my covenant with them. For I am the Lord their God. Not all of them were bad. Daniel was faithful. And God blessed Daniel materially and with inside information. One day when Daniel was praying for forgiveness for him and his people while they were in Babylon, as Moses prophesied that they would do in Leviticus, the angel Gabriel appeared to him. Daniel 9.21, Daniel wrote, Yea, while I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening oblation. Gabriel told Daniel, Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Seventy weeks, Daniel was knew that they were nearing the end of their 70 years of captivity as Jeremiah had prophesied. And he, he was asking, you know, are, are we going to be okay after that? And 70 weeks, that, that doesn't sound bad at all. But it was a little more complex than that. I have spent years trying to understand what Gabriel told Daniel. I have written an explanation of my understanding, several of them. I, I placed them on Facebook. If you click on Files in Marine Baptist Church Facebook, you'll see Daniel 9 Sermon doc. You can download it and read it, and it goes in to the, the coded message that Daniel got from Gabriel and explains it. If you click on the three dots on the right, it gives you a download button that, that you can use to download too. MTL.txt is also written to explain Daniel 9. You can download it also. And I have these on Marine Baptist Church Sunday service too. <clears throat> I've also got a video on Marine Baptist Church Sunday service that I put out this week an explanation of Daniel 9. And I, I write there, this video explains the Bible verses in Daniel 9 that pertain to the Messianic timeline scriptures. I am making this video available because it offers an explanation of the coded message that the angel Gabriel gave Daniel when Daniel prayed for God to tell him how long the Jews were going to be in captivity. Activity. Gabriel told Daniel 70 weeks. Later on, he's, he tells him seven weeks and three score and two weeks. Then he tells him three score and two weeks. 
And then he tells them, one week. This is my understanding. Gabriel told Daniel that it was going to be a while before the Jews would be restored. And some other things would be happening before resurgence. One, the Messiah. Jesus was going to arrive 483 years after the date when the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem was given. And I explained this in the, those papers. Two, the church age. The age of the Gentiles would last an undetermined amount of time and will be followed by the seven-year period described in Revelation. This is a general timeline of the period known as the church age or the age of the Gentiles. And let me just call your attention to the fact that the Jews had a temple and synagogue. We are the church, the Gentiles. Okay, I've, I've numbered the uh, items that I want to call your attention to on this timeline. One, Jesus gives his life to redeem us, the church. His ecclesia has called out. Two, that began the church age. Three, Jesus returned to God. Four, we've been waiting ever since for the seven-year period of Revelation. Five, there will be a rapture. The church will be taken out of the world. Six, 144,000 Jews, 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes will be sealed with the Holy Spirit. And seven, there will be a wrath, the time of Jacob's trouble. And God gave us a glimpse of all those things in the book of Daniel. One day, God is going to say, okay, that's it. This is a picture that I use a lot or of God to represent God. Revelation 10, 6. And swear by him that liveth forever and ever, who created heaven and the things that therein are, and the earth and the things that therein are, and the sea and the things which are therein, that there should be time no longer. That's it. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished as he hath declared to his servants the prophets. In 2 Peter 3, 9, we learn why God delays, why we've had the Gentile age, the age of the church. And this is what Peter said. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He's waiting on us. Now, um, at this point, I'm going to do something a little bit different than I normally do. I'm going to play a song that is out on YouTube. It's um, sung by the Hoppers. The name of the song is Jerusalem. And um, you, you won't see these people, but, but they're out there. You know, you, you go and look for this, and, and you can find this. And I'm going to escape out of here now. Dear God, we thank you for all that you have done to save me and your church. We pray that you will guide us to some soul who needs you but doesn't know the way. 
and that you will fill us with your knowledge so we will have the words to tell them how to be saved and what they need to do to make their lives right with you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. God bless you.